All right. All right. Well, good morning, ladies. Are you ready to make history? Oh, I should say that again. Are yes, you ready to make history? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. Awesome. Well, I would like to welcome and thank you both for engaging in this conversation with me regarding National Black Women's Equal Pay Day today. When I was first approached about this opportunity to lead this discussion from our Attorney General's office and shout out to the Delaware Department of Justice for recognizing the need for this discussion and suggesting this platform, platform by the way, I got to tell you, I was immediately honored and then hit by the weight and the responsibility of this conversation. Or, you know, this is going to impact Black women. So recognizing that a lot of layers are in this topic, we know that we won't be able to cover them all in our 45 minutes together today, but we can begin to erase the awareness and start by starting this discussion. Agree? Agree. Great. Awesome. So let me begin by making the introductions and level setting today's expectations. I'm ABC. Andrea Brown Clark, happily married wife of 23 years, the mother of two young ladies, ABC two and three, a former corporate executive for 30 years, working in the space of diversity consulting and recruiting and management. And I'm a current entrepreneur for the last 14 years, activist, mentor, and coach. I've invited Mrs. Estelle Matthews, a former corporate diversity colleague of mine, who is now retired and living her best life because she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience regarding this topic. Over 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong. And Miss Danielle Clark, without an E, no relation, but she's going to be my newfound friend. And she is the newly elected president for the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League's Young Professionals because I know that her perspective will lend tremendous value to today's conversation. Did I miss anything, ladies? Other than the no. fact that my, my 40 plus years in corporate America, I was a senior vice president of human resources. Um, so, and supporting um, top executives up to the CEO of the company. So I just awesome. want to reference who I really am and the work that I did across corporate America. Absolutely. And that's the value and the input and perspective. I'm looking forward to, forward to share, hearing from you today. So let's begin by starting our conversation, which will hopefully bring attention and raise awareness for some while affirming our Black women and sisters at the same time, okay? So just to give you a little history on my, uh, where I come from. I come from a family that was male dominant. I had one grandmother with 11 children, one girl, my mother, and another grandmother with seven children, again, with one girl, my aunt. That said, I was raised not to feel inferior or less than in any way. They set a powerful presence by the strength and the way they move without having to say much. Does that make sense? If it makes sense to you, it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, back then, when I think about my grandmother and I remember her passing, I remember saying to myself, how did she do so much with so little? You see, she came from Birmingham, Alabama, and she moved to North Philly. And in her journey, along her journey, she was able to provide for so many and, you know, by taking care of the homes of others as a housekeeper and domestic, and then come home with a smile and a little, it wasn't a whistle, it was like a, she would always do this, she was singing, and she just had grace, you know, she never complained about anything, she just moved in a way in a spirit that um, just con commanded respect, but she didn't make a lot of money. And she definitely wasn't treated the best way. And so while we have come a long way, ladies, I know that we still have so much further to go. And that's what I'd like to discuss today. You know, I live in a, in a place where my mother, um, who did graduate, who, who went to Temple University in North, in, in North Philly, um, she was given that opportunity. So we went from a legacy of a housekeeper to a person that went to college and was able to manage her career as an executive assistant. And what I learned watching her was that she was doing all the work, but someone else, a man, a white man to be exact, was getting all the credit. So from the two of them and watching them in my experience, I made a choice and a decision that I didn't even realize was gonna impact you know, me and my family along the way. But I decided when I was in high school, I would not take the two electives that we were scheduled and slated to take. And that was home economics and typing. I refused to take them. And by me refusing to take them, I had to select another and I decided to select engineering and drafting. Who knew that for four years, I would be the only woman, let alone or young girl, black person in those classes. 
But that opened up a journey for me that I didn't even know was going to happen. I was then later able to attend college in Boston and my world changed. You know, it gave me a, a level of experience <laughs> that allowed me to move my career and manage my career in corporate America, where I met Ms. Estelle uh, doing some of the diversity work in HR. And I was able to command a six-figure salary that no one in my family had done before. But I learned that the higher up I went, the less of us I saw. So I knew that there had to be a difference. I stayed there for a while because I wanted to impact change. And here we are having this conversation. Let's see, September 2nd, um, 2021. It's been over 30 years. And since the journey began, you know, civil rights has been almost 60 years. And we're still having this conversation. Why is that? That's what I want to ask you to today. What would you like to share so we can begin this discussion from your perspective and why we're still having this conversation at this moment? So I'll jump in. Um, I, I think part of the reason why we're still having this conversation is because we're the only ones really having this conversation. And so for me, I would really like to see the narrative shift so that we are no longer having these types of conversations amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. That the narrative shifts because people who are dominant by race and by gender uh, understand exactly what's going on, but yet we continue to talk about it so they can better understand it. And my, my ask and one is, you have the conversation. Whenever there are race issues in this country, and especially around Black Lives Matter, you know, Me Too, you know, my experience has been with a lot of my white colleagues is that they want to read books. And so people go to books because that's a comfort level for them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, stop reading books, talk to each other, because you know what you know. Change the narrative so it's not about us talking about us so that you better understand us. It is now time for you to talk about you, what you know about your privileges, how you got to where you are, and to go back to your point around education and wanting to do this and wanting to do that. We have worked as women of color extremely hard, preferably African-American women, extremely hard to get a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not going to be respected at that table, I don't want to sit there. Amen. If I'm not going to be equal to everyone at that table, I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And it might seem to others that I'm aggressive and I'm angry and I could be all those things. Sit with that because I'm no longer looking to make people comfortable about an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. So I'll pause there. Okay. All right, dropping gems as I knew you would. As I knew you would. How about you, Miss Danielle? What would you like to introduce to the conversation? Uh, well, thank you for for one for having me, you know, on this show. Uh, but my experience as far as uh, discrimination in the workplace uh, stems from uh, my previous experience in management. Um, I'll, I'll give a little background of, uh, on myself uh, at the age of twenty. Uh, I started a career in real estate and, uh, and mortgaging. Um, from there, I started working mortgaging maybe about three to five years. And then I made the decision to do property management. Um, while I, you know, I am the latter, I started out as a leasing consultant and moved my way up and, and until uh, into a position of, uh, you know, middle management, property management. Uh, there is where I came across a situation that to me had absolutely nothing to do with my performance, um, but more or less had to do with uh, my look. And so these are the situations that, uh, for me, uh, affected me economically. Uh, so as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, the, the wage gap uh, is, is one conversation, but when we have folks in corporate America that are focused on uh, the look of, of Black women or, or Black women uh, looking unprofessional or unkept, you know, it's like, how do you even get to that conversation of the fact that my value mm -hmm. comes from the, the uh, what I'm capable of doing, you know? So I see these concepts 
are raised, you know, uh, as at a uh, point where I'm paid for what I'm worth because of what I've developed in my mind, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and what I, I think we're losing you, Danielle. You might be yeah. in a bad space because yeah. um, we're starting to hear every other word. Um, so yeah. while she's pausing, uh-huh. is she back? Because I can jump in and support. Go ahead, go ahead. So I want I want to support what I think Dan where Danielle is going around, you know, competency level and skills and mm-hmm. what we bring to the table. But oftentimes, even in today's environment, uh, accomplished we, self, the, the money that I put into my education. Okay, Danielle, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. We're, you're going in and out from us right now. And I think, and and, that's, and this is the thing, when we were talking about this, joking about this and relating to this before we began this conversation, we wear many hats as women and as black women. And we're gonna talk about that a little in a few moments, um, but because we always have to multitask and we, we, you know, the world doesn't stop just because we wanna have a conversation. So I appreciate you, you know, signing in and, and joining this conversation with us. Uh, when you get to a space that we can hear you a little, or maybe when you get a little stationary, then I uh, definitely want you to continue what you were just starting to share. Estelle, did you want to finish? With, with yeah, I, I, I just, I just want to jump in and support uh, where I think, and I'm not speaking for Danielle, but I think oftentimes, um, you know, we come with the credentials, the education, you know, and we have to put that on the table right up front so that we get included or people mm-hmm. see us differently. And I recognize and realize most folks don't have to do that, right? So I don't have to come in there. If I'm invited in, there is a reason why I'm invited in is because Uh I'm bringing my expertise, I'm bringing my experience and I'm bringing a whole host of of ideas and understanding of this process. But Uh the thing for me is that we still have to go through that door uh, being judged and without even knowing, you know, Correct. So we judge from the book because we belong to a group. You know, people see us at the group level before they even see us as individuals. So we have to almost earn the right to be an individual. Mm -hmm. So they see us as a group called Black women. Mm -hmm. And what they know about Black women is always, you know, somewhere in in the, in the, 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 the mindset of this is what I know. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we have to go into that setting, understanding who we're up against. And many times for me, and including you, I was the only and uh, only woman of color sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, you know, find our voice, (laughs) get in where we fit in Mm -hmm. and all the work that we do. So that even takes away from what we've done to get there, you know, children, preparation you know, getting to work, working and helping the kids. And so we bring all that stuff. And for those of us who have and been dealing with the husbands as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, African-American women, preferably black women have always been um, the driving force. And we bring so much to a table when I witness and I watch women of color, Mm -hmm. again, preferably black women sit at a table, they're loaded. Absolutely. And loaded with understanding and knowledge and they know how to shift. When I supported, um, you know, the vice chairman of, of core states and, 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 and um, moved over into Wachovia, I understood the dynamics of what was really playing out. And it wasn't so much that they didn't value me. They didn't know how to engage me, uh-huh. which I found very interesting because we're easy. Uh-huh. We're easy to talk to. We get along with most folks most of the time, but I have fought for many, 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 many years for women to get the right pay, being Uh in HR, for women to get the right promotions, and all the things that I know that have happened for African-American women. Uh In the the world of core states, I'm going way back. In the early 90s, I was the second highest ranking African-American woman at the senior vice president level. And people were astonished that I was just getting there. Uh Just getting there. Always thought you were. I didn't get stock options. You know, I didn't get the bonuses that they got until I was elevated to that place. 
Now noting that I'm supporting investment bankers, commercial bankers, all the top executives, but yet my position didn't afford me the same opportunity that I helped all of these men and women get to a place where they were being profitable. So the, the work still continues and, and, and I just want to be able at some point, and this is, I, I don't know if this will ever happen in my lifetime. I don't, <laughs> and I'm being optimistic, but mm -hmm. I don't in my lifetime that we will all be seen as equals, mm -hmm. right? I remember uh, 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 one of my uh, top uh, managers said to me one time because they brought a gentleman in um, to replace me in a position that I had moved on to another position. He moved me out to put this guy in and they created this cute position for me before I got up to a top level. Mm -hmm. And I went to him and asked him why, why? You, you know, he, he's getting the title and he's getting the money. And he looked at me and he said, you have a husband and mm. you have children. Wow. And even if you don't make the money, your husband. So he Bye. assumed all these things would make mm -hmm. me feel better. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said to him, you've got to be kidding me. Does my worth here matter to you? Mm -hmm. Does what I do matter to you? And, I, and oh, by the way, I had to train this guy. So I got very clear about the dynamics around gender mm -hmm. before I did fully understand the race component. Because for me, they're intertwined. They are. Well, we can't separate know. them because of we the way we can't separate. <laughs> well, so you know, this know is, know this is what we were birthed into. I don't know if I'm dealing in my gender. I don't know if I'm dealing in my race. Oftentimes right. I have to stop and pause and realize that the inequities that are happening are twofold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you just said a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, I knew that this conversation was going to be woo layers and it can't just be one. It did, like I said in our discussion leading into this, um, this didn't happen, this is systemic. This is society. You know, if this is gone, it's come a long, it's happened for a long time. So it's not going to be fixed in this one conversation. However, you just peel back so many layers. I want to make sure that we don't miss any of them because I was relating and resonating with you coming from the same space at Core States and Wachovia and the diversity and the training and the awareness. Uh, you know, like I shared, uh, you know, when I started there, I walk in, I walk in, I was AB then, I was an ABC, now I'm ABC, but I walk in as who I am, and the, the women, the strong women in my life, and the men in my life, I have to say, in my family, not, not out in society, in my family, empowered me with my self-worth. I knew who and whose I was. So there was no way that someone else was going to kind of impact that or impede my progress. I was on a mission, right? But what I didn't realize until I started doing the diversity work in corporate America was that others perceived me as a subordinate. Now, I've never been submissive, I've never been a subordinate, but because by very nature of my gender and my race, that's who they saw when I walked in the room. I can't change that, it is who I am. But they made several judgments and prejudices and preconsumptions based upon that up to and including salary. I had to demand what I wanted because I knew what I was worth and I was able to have those conversations. I did also have an experience at the bank when I was when it had converted to Wachovia where I did not accept a, a, a promotion because I didn't want to take it at that time. I knew there was more work for me to do in the space that I was in and they positioned a white woman in that position above me and she, you know, and I was there to support her. I said that I would, no problem. Well, when it came, and I was the leader of that team, right? When it came time for my review, I was told that I was, even though I had performed, outperformed double digit growth and everything else, and that, you know, everything was working the way it was supposed to, I was leading the team. She was in the position, but I was leading the team. I was told that I was not going to have a raise that year. And I paused. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> my question, yeah, I did not accept that because again, I knew my worth. So when we started the conversation, she said, well, do you know your, you know, your, I know what my salary is, but she said, do you know what your salary is? It's above the range that, you know, this position pays. And I said, well, when they hired me as a VP in this department, they hired me above that range. I know my worth. That's what happened. So what you're telling me now is that you will no longer incentivize me to do the work that I was paid to do. So what you also have just told me is that I've outgrown this position. 
So there's no other conversation for us to have. And I left that department because of that. Now, thank goodness, because of the work that I had and knowing my worth and the relationships that I built, the people within the bank supported me. And they came to me and offered me another opportunity because I was really getting ready to walk away. You sometimes have to close a door in order to open up the one that's right for you and step into your purpose. And so that's part of this conversation. We have to raise the awareness because again, this was an HR. And if HR can do it for you, imagine what's happening out there on the front line, right? The other conversation and layer that I wanted to pull back that you mentioned is, um, and, and Danielle mentioned it earlier about her hair. I remember having to have this conversation with my mother. I had had my first child. I had all this hair. She had all this hair. I figured I've done enough. I have to be at work at seven o'clock in the morning. I, I live my life with my hair. I'm going to go get braids. I had never had the braids before. My mother almost had a heart attack. No way. You can't do that. I said, what do you mean? She said, in your position, you're not able to do that. My own mother was holding a judgment and prejudice because in her opinion, if you elevate to a certain level, you have to assimilate. You can't continue to be yourself. You have to assimilate. And I had to have the conversation and education with her to say, I've earned the right to sit in this seat. And this is before Indy Irie came out with that song, I Am Not My Hair. So I love celebrating with you ladies because I see you've come a little bit. <laughs> all of us on this camera today, in this, this interview today, all of us have natural hair and we're walking proud in it unapologetically. But these are baby steps, baby steps. I'm proud to say my ABCs two and three have natural hair too. They are growing. And you know, I hope that they will continue to have opportunities. But I do know today, still 40, 30 plus years later, Black women are making on average 63 cents to the dollar of a white man for the same position. And to your point, Estelle, they have to deal with so much other stuff before even walking in to work to sit at the table with a smile. So how do we change that? <laughs> Shift the narrative. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep saying that because it's the ownership of this is not on us. It is not. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in graduate school, I wrote my thesis on group and system dynamics that create occupational stress and depression for women across race. And I got very clear about the impact that the world at large was having on women of color, preferably again, black women. Mm -hmm. And so we don't get to change it. The narrative has to change. That's right. White women have to come out and support us around race as we support them around gender. Mm -hmm. Change the narrative, make the conversation real about the impact that African-American women, the impact that is on African-American women as we all know it around race. Compound that with the impact around gender. Stop reading the books and start having the conversation. That's right. White men, White people in general need to start having that conversation. So I'm not just putting the ownership on white women, but the reason why I, I'm very adamant about it is because <clears throat> white women step back and let that be about white men and it's about both. Correct. And then we have to look at our own men, men of color, preferably black men, mm -hmm. and they have to take a stand for us too. Mm -hmm. So we're oppressed on many levels and in many areas mm -hmm. of our lives. And yet we, we, we rise, we continuously rise. That's right. Great, so great. I don't know if we, we will ever change it until we all change it. You are correct. It, it is a dialogue with difference and it, is, it requires you know, support from every entity, every race and gender for them to come together and acknowledge what we already know. We are beautiful and we are worthy in our own skin. And to that point, I've heard you mention a couple of times, you know, this conversation, I do want to specifically keep us on the topic of Black women and, and um, you know, our earning potential and the wage gap. I identify as a Black woman. I remember, and I'd love to know what you, what you two identify as. I remember working in HR and seeing the African American block that was now put on and then the other block and, you know, this thing. And I was like, but I'm not that. <laughs> I've never been to Africa. I, you know, why are they telling me who I, and I would write black, you know, that I just, I had to stay in who I was. I couldn't assimilate to what they wanted me to be. So I ask you, how do you feel about that? Especially coming from, you know, the world of HR as well. Um, what did you feel about that? And how do you identify? 
So, so let me, so first of all, it's, it's not what people call me. It's what I answer to, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've been a whole lot of names throughout sure. our lifetime. Mm -hmm. I identify as a woman who happens to be black. Awesome, awesome. So go ahead, Estelle. See, we 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 can we can deal with in, in any adversity, right? Yes, we can. What doesn't so, kill so, us? So you know, I, you know, I always say to people, you know, I don't like being called this, and I said it's not what you're called; it's what you respond to. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I got very clear that my gender was my top priority. So I identify as a as a woman who happens to be black. Very because everything that happens to me happens to every woman out there. Mm -hmm. And so I get clear about how I get impacted across my own race. So that's why I go there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm very un unapologetic for and people say, yeah, but you're black. I, and yeah, I am, but I'm a woman first. Yeah. Because yeah. I have to deal in, in who I am Mm -hmm. when I'm out and about. It's like a double-edged sword. So I hope that answered your question. It did, it did. And Danielle, if you're able to speak, and thank you for sharing that. Um, Danielle, if you're in a position to speak, I'd love to hear uh, how you identify as well. If not, we'll come back to you. Because <laughs> again, I know you're multitasking. <laughs> Go ahead, Estelle. So that, you know, the, the, the pay and equity thing is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And if you listen to people, it's almost as if you look at people and say, are you serious? Because people justify what they give you, how they give it to you and why they give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's always with a caveat of, I'm not sure if you can do it. This is a new position, blah, right. blah, blah. But mm -hmm. oftentimes when you apply for a position, you come with experience, knowledge, and understanding. Yeah. Great skills and competencies le levels all the time. Mm -hmm. But we're always asked to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if the minimum, I'm just making all this up, if the minimum is $90,000, mm -hmm. rather than give you $100,000 or $110,000, because you come with experience, you come with knowledge, you mm -hmm. come with competency levels and skills, I'm just going to start you at 90 and we're going to watch and see what happens for the first 90 days. I'm telling you, I used to fight with recruiters every day, all day. Uh -huh. But what I believed, based on someone's resume and the interviewing skills that, that took place, what their right. work was. And so I'm saying you don't bring people in, you know, with expertise, with great competencies and skills and experience. And then devalue them. And then devalue them. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And so this happened for women over mm -hmm. and over and even with titles and over again. And so I used to fight, not just for me. Right. Because I believe when I was fighting for women, I was fighting for myself, mm -hmm. for all women, mm -hmm. because it was important for me to have your worth and, and, and value acknowledged and appreciated. Absolutely, absolutely. Danielle, it looks like you are now available to contribute to the conversation. I so. am. Thank you for your patience. I apologize about that. Uh, it's, Don't need uh, to apologize. Uh, we see you doing what you got to do. <laughs> yes, yeah, signal was going in and out. Um, so I'll, I'll just go back to uh, what I was discussing, you know, before, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, you know, my signal kept cutting out. Uh, just discussing the experience that I've had with discrimination in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, which in my opinion lead up to that, uh, the, the, the pay gap. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in my eyes, it's completely ridiculous because what it is is uh, uh, personal, in my opinion, personal feelings and personal philosophies and personal emotions being brought to mm -hmm. corporate America. Mm -hmm. And uh, where it becomes a problem is when my economic status be, uh, is affected because of your personal, you know, yeah. opinion. Um, I could care less what someone feels about me or what they say about me in their home. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the boardroom, so to speak, 
Um, we are all there to achieve one purpose, and that's to move the company that we work for and, and forward. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, so what we bring to the table uh, is our intellect, is our rationale, is our logic, is our experience, is our education, and that's what we should be uh, judged on. Uh, so my previous experience, and this is why I'm so, uh, when I saw the Crown Act um, being introduced, um, I was uh ecstatic because what it told me was that I'm, I was not alone. Mm-hmm. And, and that's some of the issues that I, I came across uh, psychologically, emotionally, was this feeling of alienation when, when someone tells you uh, that you are unkept. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and because of this unkeptness uh, in your natural state, now your livelihood is threatened. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, now, whether or not you'll be able to support your child is threatened. Now, even, uh, you know, whether you're a single mom or a married woman, <clears throat> what you're able to contribute to your family is now threatened. Mm-hmm. And uh, so these small things are, 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 are things that are used as building blocks against black women. And uh, it's all based off of personal uh, opinion. It's, it's, it's racism, mm-hmm. you know. Bottom line, and I personally feel like racism does not have a place in corporate America. It doesn't. Uh, that is, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I could scream and, uh, and to the mountaintops about how, you know, you should, uh, 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 as, as a person of uh, uh, not of color, should change your opinion about me. But to be honest with you, that's between you and wherever your conviction falls. Okay. Mm-hmm. I hope that you find whatever it is uh, that you need to find to open up your mind. But when you, the, the second that you hit that boardroom, uh, leave your personal opinions at the door, you mm-hmm. know? And in that light, I believe if we could achieve a, a true professional environment where we could do that, then we will begin to see changes starting to take place and, and you start to pay people fairly because what you're, what you're basing it off of is how is this person able to perform the job that I hired them for, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so my, my personal experience was, uh, you know, as a manager, uh, I decided to, uh, well, as a, as a black woman, I decided to uh, uh, stay true to myself and stop putting all of the toxins in my hair. It was a journey uh, uh, for me. It's a personal journey for me. Uh, and I made sure that I was uh, maintained. Uh, but when I came across, uh, 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 you know, the, the workplace, it was when it became a problem and when my livelihood was threatened. So that's my personal story. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I agree that I, uh, with Estelle, I, I am a woman first, okay? I'm a woman uh, I do identify as a black woman, but that's one character trait of me. And, it, and it, it's, uh, it's not the end all, be, like, you know, I'm, I'm much more mm-hmm. than just that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am also, uh, I love to write. So I have many other things right. and attributes <clears throat> to me. Mm-hmm. And those things are the things that are of value in corporate America. And those are the things that I want to be judged on. I want to be judged on how how well I write, how I have uh, uh, spent so much time, you know, in journalism courses and, you know, for time, you know, documentary courses and all these courses and all all this education so that I can add value to myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the value that I want to be paid upon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what, I, I think that at this point, uh, there needs to be some answers. Why is it that a black woman who has the same exact credentials, who has been in the industry for the same amount of time, who has uh, the same amount of work experience, and when she's compared to her white counterpart, why is it that she's paid less, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, I think it's just more comfortable for, you know, these corporations to, you know, turn a deaf ear. But I think that that time is up. That's right. You know, 
And that's exactly why, again, we're having this conversation at this time, to, and, you know, in this moment, because we don't want to miss the moment today. And I knew this conversation was going to be powerful with you ladies. I knew it. <laughs> I was so excited. And I really am. I like, I could go on forever, but I know we got to keep this time short, you know. Um, but yeah. that, that just means we're going to have to continue conversations in the future. It's interesting okay. that you said that um, you both identify, and, 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 I, and it's funny, I'm asking this question because I see now people say, you know, him, her, she, this, that. I don't do that. I really don't. I never have. Even when I worked in corporate America, I never said, this is my title. This is my, I just, like a cell. you didn't even know that I did some of the stuff that I did. And we worked at the same place because I just showed up as me. Like you hired me for me. The person that hired me knows who I am. They know why they hired me. They know what I'm here to do. I'm here to do the job. And I show up to do the job. That's it. That's all you need to know about me. Um, but I honestly identify as Black first. And I don't know if it's because of where I came from and the history of my family and, you know, coming from nothing. I know what we had to do to get, and I knew what I had to do and the shoulders that I was able to step on or in my family and my legacy um, that put me in position to be able to do the other things that I did. So when I made my journey in, in my career, um, I made sure that I looked out for people that look like me because I didn't have a roadmap when I started. Nobody in my family had ever done anything that I did. And I noticed that the higher up I went, the less of me I saw, like we talked about a cell. So when I would see a black person specifically show up, male or female, and, I, and they were showing up for an interview or something, and I knew they didn't come the right way, I would pull them aside. I didn't let them go into an interview. I had a conversation. I felt that was me giving back to because maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't have the support at home. Maybe they never had the conversation. Maybe nobody invested in them to let them know that they were worth more. So I would have those conversations because I wanted to see our people do better. I also created synergies of influence for our people because when we did identify in our diversity work, Black people to be managed up into leadership. And by the way, that's another conversation, a point we have to have. Where are they looking for leaders? Because I remember having conversation with CEOs at the bank that said, well, they just don't apply. Black people just don't apply for these positions. I said, excuse me? You're in the city of mm -hmm. Brooklyn Love. Where are you looking? On the golf course? Yeah. Yeah. To the places that they show up. Yeah. 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 You can't tell me. <laughs> There's yeah. nobody out here that is Black that can be in this position because they are not interested or not qualified. So we had to change, we had to have those conversations. And having those conversations allowed us to begin to make the shifts and dynamics that need to happen. Now we, go ahead, Estelle. But you see what you're saying? <laughs> so I want you both to understand what you're doing here, right? Both of you, because you're both worthy of everything that is good. You are. But we're explaining this away again, again. about what we did, how mm -hmm. we did this. It's not on us anymore. That yeah. same conversation when I was at Wells Fargo is still being had about not being able to find people of color for position. Understand, mm -hmm. it's not our conversation. It's their conversation. Mm -hmm. So why aren't they sitting on a, on a, on a um, an interview <laughs> site, on the <this> site, <laughs> having conversations about what they know about us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't fix this, guys. We can't yeah. fix it. We're stretching all the way back in our history, talking about what life has been like for us. They mm -hmm. already know. Yeah. We know. And we've said I could finish many... your conversation if I wanted to. I could finish yeah, your yeah. conversation right, if right, I wanted right. to. Right, right, right. But what is all this for? And again, I applaud you for doing this. I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm tired of carrying people. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fannie Mae. Yeah. What did Fannie Mae, um, what's her name? Oh God. She said, I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. When all this stuff started, all of this Black Lives Matter, me too, and people were calling me, you know, you're a diversity. Can we get you on a Zoom? Can we get you on a Zoom? Right. Can we get you on a Zoom? I said, no, mm -hmm. I'm tired of having this conversation. I've been having this conversation all my life. Mm -hmm. All of my life, mm -hmm. at some point, we have to say no more. Yeah. I, I get your credentials. I get your sister. I love you both so dearly. And your pain mm -hmm. is my pain. Mm -hmm. It's my pain. And that's how we lift each other up. Yes. And that's how we support. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to live it, but I know pain. They don't have to live my experience, but they know pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Go to that place and stay with it. Get uncomfortable about what you now have heard from us and sit with mm -hmm. it. Uh -huh. And then figure out, white people, what you're going to do to change it. Uh -huh. yeah. Because for me, corporate America will never change because the racism, the sexism, the heterosexism is beyond us. Uh -huh. It is institutionalized in the world. It started with greed and power. Uh -huh. And it still exists today. Uh -huh. So put it there because the dynamics don't shift and people are afraid to share wealth and they're afraid to share, you know, the life that we want to have. They're afraid of it. That's uh -huh. why all these people, that's why the resurrect resurrection started. That's why all this stuff is happening. Uh -huh. It's out of fear. Out Absolutely. Of fear. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's all it is. It's true. It's true. Um, you Fannie, know, I, Fannie Mae Heyman said it. Fannie <laughs> <laughs> Knew you would come through with it. Yeah. So you, and, and, and it's interesting that you say that. And, um, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't dispute anything that you said. Oftentimes when we have these moments that in, and we are, when we have elevated our careers and our positions, white people, unfortunately, will come to us and continue to come to us as the subject matter expert for everybody Black. What do I do? What should I say? How should I show up? I don't have the answers for everybody. I only have the answers for me. <laughs> and that's what I will speak on. But I also cannot continue to um, or pretend to ignore that we still have to continue to have the conversation, these conversations, because I still have ABC 2 and 3 my black ladies that are growing up, my children, and I need to provide a space for them where they're not still fighting the same battles I was fighting 50 years ago. We can't do that. Yeah. And we can't do it in silence. I don't want us to suffer in silence. We have to have these conversations unapologetically now. Before it used to be, okay, you know, kumbaya, let's hold hands, you know, everybody's included. No, I never did that. I never kumbaya nobody. You know, okay. Well, I, I knew that at a certain point I had to in the beginning. I had to, I chose to, so that I could connect and build relationships. But I still never, I was always me. Like I said, I, I was raised in a way to be me, empowered by who I am and the skin that I met, Black and then a woman. Um, and now, you know, here I am. This is it. This is this is me. And it has been for, for a while. This has been me. But I now am having a conversation to say, yes, I am Black. And this is what I stand for. Yes, I am Black. And I want to advance the community that I live in and that have been historically disenfranchised, marginalized, criminalized, you know, all of these things. And it comes back to the equality. Equity equals equality. We have to pay our people, Black people all together, what they are worth. But Black women, again, are making a fraction of the dollar. I just heard or read somewhere statistically that um, during the COVID, which exacerbated everything, you know, they, they realized that Black and Latino women had less than $300 in their bank. You know, they're working most of the minimum wage jobs that are out here today. They have to choose between daycare. They have to choose between putting food on the table. They have to choose between paying their rent. How can they do this if we're not paying them what they are worth? We have to make sure that we continue to hold the people in power. We have to hold them accountable. And that's why we're having this conversation. Did you want to say something else, Tanya? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. well, I would like to say that, uh, you know, in regards to that, uh, we should start looking at uh, how that affects production of the company overall, uh, or you shortchange them. Then the, then they, they begin to lack resources, you cause more strain on them. Having to decide between, you know, child care and going to work, you know, those are things that distract your employees from actually producing. So I don't really think that, that, that uh, uh, disregarding or, or paying Black women less is, is productive in, in anybody, you know, uh, uh, arena, you know. Uh, you... You, if you want the best output, then you have to put in the best input. And that's how, that, that's capitalism in, in the bags. You, you need to invest in your human capital if you want your human capital to, uh, if you want to increase production. And so that, that's just, you know, the bottom line. So in, in, in my uh, uh, opinion, I do believe that uh, it's a hindrance to everyone. 
you know, uh, it, it, you know, and that's why I said personal opinions and, 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 you know, biases and things like that need to be kept out. If you want to worry about the bottom line and the production, then you mm-hmm. need to invest in every single last one of your employees fairly, you know, so that they can become sustainable. So when they step across that threshold and come to work, Absolutely. they are now concerned about producing for you. And that is it. You know, but now I have to think about, you know, why am I getting paid less? Now I have to think about, you know, uh, where can I find a, a, least, uh, a, a less expensive babysitter? Can I afford babysitting? Mm-hmm. You know, can I afford to work for you? Right. You know, and, and so, you know, it, the bottom line is, is, you know, most of these corporations are simply just concerned about that, their bottom line. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the bottom line is you don't invest in, into your employees and you, and you, you, you lose production. And, and so maybe in that sense, uh, maybe it makes sense there, you know, maybe it makes sense there. Um, uh, uh, because I do agree with Mr. Stell that, you know, historically for decades, we have been writing, we have been shouting, we have been screaming, we have been marching and saying the same things over and over and over again. But uh, in my opinion, it's like that, you know, you hit them where it hurts in the the pocket, make it make sense numerically, Mm -hmm. you know, it it does not make sense for your, for your pocket to, to, to uh, shortchange any of your employees. You know, it's just like uh, the the argument that when you don't educate, it's been statistically proven that when you don't educate the women in your society, your, your GDP, you know, is lower. You produce more when you educate the women in your society. Well, it's the same thing, in my opinion, for your corporation. The more you invest in your employee, then mm-hmm. the better your production becomes, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, so maybe in that sense, then it, it, it will make sense numerically, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so, you know, those are my thoughts. And I agree. I, I totally agree with you. I don't want you to, to misunderstand my point. No, no, so, no, I got you. Yeah. Everything you just said, Danielle, is accurate. However, the corporations are still making tons of money. Mm-hmm. And when women of color, Black women, raise the issue around, why not me too? Then the pushback always becomes, look, I did, a, I did HR for so long. I, I had so many discrimination charges and so many women coming to me saying, I'm being forced out. When you raise that bar too, when you raise that noise too loud, they will force you out Mm -hmm. because they hold the power and you will fight every day for survival. And what I'm saying is (laughs) they, white people, have got to start taking a stance on this. Mm -hmm. Corporate America is not losing a dime. Neither is the McDonald's around the corner. Okay, they're not losing money. We're talking, but when we're still patronizing, we're still going to the same banks. We're still asking for the same loans. We're still asking for the things that prohibit us from growth and development as individuals still today. So why would I want to change Uh when it's working good? It's where they're, yeah, they hear there's there's rumble, but it's not enough. Right, right. It is not enough. Yes. And again, very powerful, um, you know, commentary that you're mentioning, because um, that's that's the work in the space that I operate in today. Make it make sense. Economic empowerment and equality. Where are you investing your money, your time, your dollars? Like if if it's a business that doesn't support me and my community, I'm not they don't own. They did not they're not guaranteed my money. That's what, that's what I tell my kids and, and everybody that I coach. You know, they're, they're not guaranteed. You choose where to spend your dollar. If you continue to contribute to someone that you know is not contributing to your community, then, you know, it's working for them. Why will they change? Why will they change? So we have to make it make sense for us and our community, and we have to start creating sustainable communities, not excluding others, you know, and saying we're never going to talk to you. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about investing in ourselves because it's time. While I still want to have a seat at the table, I don't think it has to be an either or, but I think that it's time that we start, and I want y'all to hear this. I'm going to say that for a minute. Uh, Let me ask you, because it looks like we don't need I need to stop for a minute because I'm going to need to get off this call. Okay. Um, it's almost 10 minutes after 11. So um, I'm really sorry. No, don't be sorry. 
be sorry. Tell me your fine. I was going to ask you, what is your, you, you My drop dead okay. is quarter after. No, no, no. I was going to ask you, what is your final thought? What would you like to leave so, in your so, final thought? Um, without sounding repetitive, <laughs> um, I would like to see white women and white men having this conversation. That's what I'd like. Okay. And not just having it, but actually coming up with some strategic plans on how to make a difference uh -huh. at the group level. Uh -huh. Because everybody likes to be seen as an individual. That's right. And there are white men and white women who do, do not want to own the oppression that is happening for black women. They don't want to own it. They like us, we're friends. I, I don't, you know, that's them, it's not me. But we get seen at the group level all the time. We have to earn the right to be an individual, uh -huh. but immediately we're seen as black women. So I would like to see at the group level, white men and white women having this exact same conversation and owning what they have or have not done to support the unequal pay for black women. All right. All right. Oh, I've just got a text. It looks like she's having technical difficulties. So we'll have to bring Danielle back another time to continue this conversation. But I echo everything that you just shared. So um, like I said, I knew it was going to be powerful and power packed because I know what you bring. I know what you bring. I work beside you. I respect you. You are a lifelong colleague and friend. Um, and, you know, this is a dialogue and a conversation that needs to continue with and without us. We have to have it, but we have to make some change. Right. My, my last point is uh -huh. <clears throat> I will support you no matter what, because you are my sister. And I am my sister's keeper. That's right. That's right. Right back at you, mama. <laughs> so here's what I will close with. I do believe that. Again, we need more people at the table. We need to seat at the table, but we've been saying that to your point, saying that, saying that, saying it for how long? So not but, but and, I think it's also time for us to set a new table. And by setting the new table, I'm saying we're gonna take the table and reclaim the power in that word, take action, build legacy and empower others. It is time to make a difference and impact the lives of black women to ensure that we are held and respected in the power and purpose that we walk in every day, but making sure that we are equally treated when we show up and compensated as such. I thank you, my sister. I thank you, my thank friend, you. for this conversation. I thank wish you the balance of a purpose-driven day. Love you too, Danielle. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, ladies. There we go. There we go. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> we will not let this blessing be blocked, okay? That's right. Thank you for jumping back on. Um, in conclusion, we wanted to just give you an opportunity based upon the powerful conversation that we've had today, and I knew it would be nothing less. Uh, we wanted to give you an opportunity, Danielle, to share your final thoughts on what we need to do going forward. Okay. Uh, well, I definitely do believe that uh, this is an ongoing conversation, and that's something that uh, we were just discussing. Uh, it's not something as we said before, that will be solved uh, with one conversation. Uh, it will take many conversations. And uh, as far as Ms. Mistel, uh, I agree with her. I understand where she's coming from. Uh, where at this point, you know, we've talked until we're blue in the face and what we're looking for is accountability uh, from our, our coworkers, from, uh, you know, from, from white people. You know, that, that, that's what we're looking for. Um, I have seen, you know, uh, there have been books being written. Uh, obviously, something's happening where there are books being written about uh, white accountability, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so now these discussions are starting to happen, and we need to see more of these discussions, and, and, and let's go beyond the discussions and actually start uh, taking action uh, because we can no longer tolerate uh, the variance, we can no longer uh, tolerate that inequitability. Uh, and as you said, uh, we have, you know, children and we need this to be better for them. We need uh, the effort that they put in to be fruitful. Uh, and and that, that can only take place when all parties are accountable. Absolutely. So we got to get out of the books. We got to get into application. We got to take yeah. action and we have to hold the people in position and power accountable. 
at the end of the day. That's how we grow forward. So I thank you. I thank you for sharing those final thoughts. I thank you for making yourself available. I thank you for multitasking with us all along the way. <laughs> that sun is giving you life above your head over there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> As I shared with the cell, my dear friend, and you, not my new newfound friend, um, I wish you the balance of a purpose-driven day, and I thank you for your contributions to today's discussion. All right. Thank okay. you for having me.